What's up, YouTube? It's Rico here, CEO of Surfline Asia, close to the main China podcast, uh, where we make content about business in China, life in China, business in Southeast Asia as a whole. And if you like this kind of content, like, comment, share, subscribe, 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 and check out the video. Enjoy. I notice when I walk outside, I hope this pays off. One day I chose it, one day, someday I hope it. Went in the big labels and saw plaques on walls, but I didn't post it. Did it with a gas or post it? That's not one of the things I'm made of. But one day will it pay off? Mum says I got to do music, and Dad says to not quit my day job. It's a hard one still, it's not fake, the bars are real. Sometimes I can't rely on people's advice, I can't rely on pills. I notice now, things keep falling down When they fall I still build them up Hard when you don't know how Something's changed, yeah you know the deal At the end of the day, I'm over that one still over that once When I play shows I'm sober at none Not from London, no the accent Not just talking, loads of action Is this music or is it acting? One step forward then go backwards Think it makes me over anxious Things can change, it's known to happen I feel like I don't need people's help And then when I think about it I'm proud I, could I think I came across your blog first That's how I, was, I sort of introduced you And then um, and, your, and your Twitter and uh, I, I was fascinated by, you know, the story of you going to Hong Kong and, and how that experience was for you. Um, before we sort of jump into that, can you just give like my audience a little bit of background in terms of, you know, where you grew up and how that led you to traveling in Asia and living in Asia? Absolutely. So I grew up in New Zealand, uh, the land of the long white cloud. Uh, as a teenager, my mum and dad decided that we would move to Australia, which wasn't far away um, in terms of flying three and a half hours. But um, back then it was seen as the, the land of sunshine um, and the land of opportunity. So we moved to the Gold Coast in Australia when I was uh, 16, um, which for teenagers back then, I, you know, I didn't want to move. I didn't want to leave all my friends behind, but um, it was a fantastic decision. Um, ended up going to university here in Australia and studied journalism once I decided that I wanted to be a newsreader. And that was that. There was sort of no turning back. Um, so yeah, I lived in Australia until, oh, I think it was 2010, uh, we decided to move overseas. So that came about basically, to be honest, I felt like I'd sort of missed the boat when it came to living overseas because I'd sort of been, I didn't want to leave because I was trying to get my career established in my twenties. And in my thirties, I thought, you know, that time's come and gone, unfortunately, even though it was something I really wanted to do. And uh, we were in Hong Kong for four years, which, you know, we really, really loved. I think we could have probably stayed there. You started your blog two years into living in Hong Kong. What was the moment you, you thought like, hey, I want to start a blog? Like what, what, what led you to that um, decision? I had always wanted to start, well, I'd always wanted to write a book, but then we make a joke that all journalists think they've got a book in them, right? Um, whether they have or not, it's another story. But I thought, well, look, I don't really know what I'm going to write a book about at this point. So maybe I'll start a blog. And because I'd been writing a few articles um, for local websites, I sort of got a taste for it. And, you know, being in Hong Kong, there was so much to talk about, um, especially for any Western um, friends or people that hadn't been to Asia or Hong Kong you know there was a lot to say it's a fascinating place as we said so I thought I'll just start writing down my experiences so that was two, I think two years to the day on our anniversary in Hong Kong I decided to start the blog so yeah that's eight years it's been going now um, of course I don't have quite as much to write about lately being back in Sydney but it's still got you know I think there's like 150 posts there that are so relevant to anyone who's you know living in Hong Kong or China or wants to know more about it today. So was the concept of the blog just kind of how to cope with moving to, to Hong Kong and starting a new family or like what was the, the, um, the, like the early days of the blog? I think my whole thought was always to be educationally entertaining. So I kind of like writing with a little bit of humor, but I also, so I wanted to entertain people with, you know, funny stories that we had had as Westerners, you know, in a foreign country. But I also wanted to educate people a little bit about what Hong Kong was like. There are so many things that we just don't know. So um, and, and in China, even more so. Um, and of course, the comparisons between the two 
are huge. And a lot of people don't know that. I mean, I myself am guilty of that before we moved to Hong Kong. I wouldn't have even known sort of where Hong Kong was on the map in comparison to the mainland or anything. So, you know, I think there's just so much that we don't know about the real Hong Kong, the real China. Um, I really wanted to get that across, but in an entertaining way that wasn't, you know, too boring. What was one of the first major realizations you had when, when you started living in, in Asia? Oh, gee, that's a hard one. Uh, I think I think the language barrier, of course, I mean, everyone will say that, but even though they speak Cantonese and speak English in Hong Kong, um, you know, it, and there are so many expats in Hong Kong, I think, you know, 100,000 or whatever it was, um, I could still go outside and be one of the few blonde women, you know, walking the streets. So at first culture shock did hit pretty hard. And looking back after living in China, I'm like, well, that's pretty crazy because it's such a westernized place. But I think when you've just lived, you know, in somewhere like Australia, um, it was very different for me. And I loved that. That's what I loved about it. You kind of briefly touched on this, but what were some of the main differences between living in Hong Kong and, and mainland China? I think for Xi'an, because it had such a small pool of expats, um, as opposed to Hong Kong. So, you know, probably a thousand compared to a hundred thousand. So at first, um, the language was a massive thing. I just remember driving into Xi'an the first night we arrived and, you know, even in Hong Kong, they had English under the signs, under the Chinese characters, whereas here there was no English whatsoever. So it's just that daunting fact that you really don't know what's going on. And I was learning Mandarin, but of course it was so minimal. Um, so it's just so daunting. And then of course the fact that there are very, very few Westerners. So it's just, we lived in a hotel because my husband was managing the hotel. So we were super lucky and privileged to be doing that. Um, but still, even though they could speak a little bit of English in the hotel, it wasn't a lot. And, you know, as soon as you stepped outside of that bubble, you were kind of on your own out in the world. And it's just that fear of, you know, if your phone battery dies, how are you going to know how to get back? You know, all those little things in the beginning um, that are so overwhelming. Um, and just, you know, of course, as we know, China is, um, you know, I don't want to get into politics, but it's run by the Communist Party. So it's very, it's been very different to Hong Kong that has that Western element, that British influence, all of those things, censorship and, you know, learning how that all works, I guess, in China is, it was a huge learning curve. Getting Ava into school, I, I didn't want to put her into a fully local school just for the fact of the language thing was so huge. But she, so she went to an international school, but again, most of the people there were Chinese or Korean. Um, I think she had one little Western girl in her class, but just navigating their education system, which is so different. Just the cultural dif nuances are so different. Learning about Guanxi, learning about all of those things took a long time to get, it, it, you know, I'm still getting my head around it, but that's China. It's a force of nature. It, it's a beast that you've really got to try and understand, I guess. Yeah. I always, I always tell people it's not, it's not easy. Like I, I have a lot of respect for anybody that spends more than six months in China. And then of course yeah. the, there's people that try to change China, which is ridiculous about your experiences doing the MC work. Cause I, I, the last time I saw you was at the cross border summit um, was it last year? I think it was yeah, last year. In, uh, in, it was it was two years ago. Oh, two yeah, years ago. Okay. it was actually yeah. That's how time flies. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your book, China Blonde. Can you kind of explain to my audience what it's about? Um, and then the second question I have off of that is: Is there a particular story from the book that you think would be interesting to to talk about? Oh, gee. Um, <laughs> well, it's really the, the guts of it is what I've been talking about, I guess. And that is moving to um, a new country, stepping out of your comfort zone. And, um, you know, you've got to have a lot of faith to just, you know, know that it's, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world, but give it a go. And a China Blonde is just that 
that section of us moving from Hong Kong to China, because when I got to China, obviously, I knew that, hey, this is such an amazing, incredible country and a fascinating time to be here. This has got to be a book. So, of course, that's when I said about once I'd sort of established myself in Xi'an, which again took about 18 months to feel comfortable. That's when I started doing a lot of interviews and getting a feel for um, what what the real people think, you know, from my local hairdresser to a, a World War I veteran to, you know, um, lots of Chin local Chinese women, um, just a really broad cross section of the community. And I basically, I really didn't know how to write a book. Well, you can be, you're a journalist and a blogger. It's very different to put that all down into chapters that flow on into another chapter and another chapter. Um, so it's, it, again, that's been another steep learning curve. Is there a particular story that you, uh, stands out to you from the book? Oh, oh gosh, there are so many stories. I mean, I always think the funny ones are sort of, <laughs> like when we had our medical checkups, you, you might have, you know, when you get your visa and you have to go into the giant medical hall that sort of says aliens live here and a big sign and, you know, you're rushed from <laughs> one room to the next and poked and prodded. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, oh, my God, what are we doing? You know, and it was just kind of just funny and hilarious. You know, you're on the bed with things stuck all over you and, you know, rushed around and, that was, you know, quite a crazy time. And just visits to doctors, you know, we had an amazing doctor, but he really couldn't speak much English. And it was a lot of charades and a lot of funny stories would happen when I would take Ava to the doctors. <laughs> and, you know, he'd come all the way down and wave us off like we were long lost friends. And, you know, I went to an acupuncturist there to try all that. And after you finish your acupuncture session, you come out and there's a giant table filled with platters of dumplings and everything you can imagine. He's made lunch for you. You know, what kind of appointment do you go to that they make lunch for you after? Something that people might think is a bit crazy about me, but that's kind of the way I've always done it is just persistence. It pays off. The queen. I've come too far to turn back, so win or win is my only choice. I release songs they think it's for them, it's a cry for help, but they miss the point. What's mad is when I speak for them, I feel like I lose my voice. Yeah. But I can't linger or dwell on things, yesterday's God has been better since. Still outside and I'm settled in, still more scared than I've ever been. Still feel blessed like I never sinned.